There's a lot of story wraps that you have. Um, and I'll, I'm always curious, because of your skill as a writer and a storyteller, why do you think people don't revere you more, talk about you more in that, in that way? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more, I'm a different type of listen when you think of rappers, you know, and, and after a while, it just became a club thing. It was like, what's being played in the club? You know, I'm more like on the song writing tip. You know, you had a lot of rappers that were MCs, you know, rappers and all of that kind of stuff, just to put a good vibe out there, a good party vibe, whatever. But like with me, you got to kind of strap your seatbelt in. <laughs> you got to, you know, open your ears, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, it, I, I mean, but I think ultimately I will be, you know, as the world turns, like people, because a lot of what I was kicking it about was these are these are issues that are, are serious. And a lot of people, they, you know, when you go to the club, you don't want to hear about all of this, you know even though the beat might be pumping where it's like, yo, this is hot, like front door was, but, you know, a lot of people just want to hear something nice and light, you know, and I, I definitely come from a blues background. So, you know, that's just the blues in me, man, just putting, you know, like, yo, these different things out there, you know, just to, to for the soul, you know, that kind of thing. So, that's that's just what it is. But, you know, I, I know at the same time, there are many people who and then, they, you know, everyone's not as serious about hip hop as maybe you and I are. You know, some people just listen to it real quick and they just write it off. You know, that's a cool song, cool lyrics, you know, and then you have the people who are really into it, that really listen to lyrics and beats and really get into it. And and. Throughout the years, I, I learned that like it's it's different levels of listening. So <laughs> you know, it's all good. It's all good. That is for sure. Because yeah. uh, you know, just when you were saying that, I just thought about it. If literally, and it's obviously the same or even more for you, but if I literally took out rap from my life, I would have more than half of my life wouldn't be the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, nah, for real, man. For real. For real. It's crazy. But yeah. um, now, as all this was happening, one of the quick side things that I was always intrigued was, was the Kid and Play Slippin' remix you did. Um, oh, man, yeah, that was cool. That was cool. Because uh, I noticed early on, a lot of this stuff are Queens-related artists. Obviously, they are as well. But what, since they were so different, and at the time, they were super established. They were like, you know, yeah. plat platinum, they had their movies, they had all this stuff going on. What was it about that point in time with the uh, Face the Nation album that made that's when you collaborated with Kim Play? Well, I mean, um, at that time, I was starting to ring bells. My name was ringing bells. It was like, Lars Professor, there's this kid in the industry in general. I mean, even though they lived like in close proximity, from, you know, it was Flush and Elmhurst kind of thing, you know, they were already through the roof when I started coming out, you know, so when it came time to like, yo, who do we work with now? And then I was under like the biggest production hub, which was Rush Productions at the time. So a lot of people would go to them saying like, yo, well, who you have on the roster? And they would say like, you know, mention my name or whatever. Yo, yeah, 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 we want to get up with him. And Steve Stout was starting to manage, you know, so he was managing them at that time. So it was just a lot, a, a combination of things that happened. But um, like them dudes were mad cool. A uh, kid came over my crib, everything like that. I mean, this dude was like a full, full on star at that time. He came through the flushing, sat down with me and, you know, they told me to plan like, yo, this is what we're doing. And to this day, I'm just happy that them dudes still love that remix to this day. Like, you know, their their career at that time that that remix came out was more television than music at that time. Like, they had passed the music stage, which 
it happens sometimes. You know, Will Smith, like, it becomes more movies and television. So, you know, it, 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 it was out there, but they were more television stars when that came out. And, um, you know, a, a lot of DJs rock with it, but them guys were like television stars at that time. Yeah. Now, that, that was always one of the lesser discussed things of yours that I liked, which ties into yeah. – <clears throat> So the rush management may be the key to the next thing, which was the Nikki D. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Your man is my man. So Rush Productions got you with Nikki D then? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, well, Nikki D always, you know, because Front Door was a song that a lot of artists like, you know, so that was one of her favorite songs. She always told me, like, yo, one day we're going to work, you know, that kind of thing. And it's funny because the vibes of the songs like was like that edgy kind of bluesy kind of like snazzy, like, yo, your man is my man looking at the front door kind of like, yeah, it's like that kind of thing. And um, yeah, man, that was a Rush Productions move, man, for sure. Like, you know, we got up, I did the remix. It was dope because she came through too. Like she came through to the crib and was like, yo, you know, I right, play me some beats. And all of that, so that, that was dope. Yeah, definitely. Because the original or the album version, I should say, has the similar drum and echo to Money in the Bank, which I always thought was. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was like, "Hey, there's the there's right. there's another link." Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking of uh, subject matter and stories and different things, uh. And this fast forwards a little bit, but I'm always curious. You guys with just a friendly game of baseball with Boys in the Hood, you guys also ended up getting a lot of uh, love on soundtracks, which, yeah. which uh, if I remember correctly, the Boys in the Hood soundtrack came out before. It came out before Breaking Adams, right? No, it, it came out after. It did come it out after. Came out, yeah, yeah, yeah. It came out after. Yeah, yeah, because. The original Breaking Adams came out in January. Oh, it's the in January. Yeah, the original, the Wild yeah, Pitch. Yes. And then when it was re-released through EMI, it came out in July, which the Boys in the Hood might have came out somewhere in the interim, like you know, between those two releases. Okay, that's. I remember there was something weird about it, and I couldn't remember what it was, but. Um, which leads to just a friendly game of baseball. So the thing, uh, as we all know, especially with NWA and Fuck the Police, there's so many, the uh, police brutality songs are so identified with the West Coast, but, you know, just a friendly game of baseball, we got Sound of the Police. There's a lot of great songs from New York rappers, yourself included, that address it. So why, um, why do you think that, you guys aren't looked at more as a speaking on similar types of topics. Well, I mean, that was just, it was just a light touch on that topic, you know, whereas NWA might've like been, that might've been a recurring topic in there, you know, like fucking police, you know, like it was all throughout the songs, you know, I was just more taking it as a subject matter and building on it, like from the East coast, like like the guards, like you know, the five percent nation, they they'll take a take something and they'll build on it. Like I, right, you know, I'm gonna add on to that subject because NWA, they definitely spearheaded that movement. And then it was like, whoa, man, I, you know, we ain't feeling that shit out here either. And this is the angle that I'm gonna come from with that. And you know, that's that's all that is. You know, it's just like yo. Look at it this way too, like yo, it's just a friendly game of baseball to these dudes, like you know, and that's that's what that was. And the the phrasing of it of friendly game of baseball. Do you remember how or why that ended up being the the terminology you used? Because that that just blew my mind to hear. Yeah, that. I mean, well, that's that's the American, you know, that's the American sport, man. So it's like you know, friendly game of baseball. That's like all American, man. It's, as the police, you know, so it was just like, all right, cool. This is what we're going to liken it to, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Definitely. Okay. And with uh, with Breaking Adams, uh, getting into to making that album, since at this point you had worked on other albums and now doing your own, 
how did you find things similar or different, you know, doing the main source album versus doing, you know, wanted to edit our live, for instance? Well, now with main source breaking atoms, it was like a little bit of practice already now. It's like things were released already and kind of you kind of saw what it was about. And now to be at the helm of something, because like I said, with G-Rap, I was kind of a little bit on pins and needles, like, yo, is this all right? Like, yo, is, is this going to be good enough? That kind of thing. Then once you get that confidence and, and you know, like, I, right, I'm, you know, this stuff is accepted. People are raving about it. Now you kind of get a more quiet kind of like, all right, now I have to really give them the, 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 the real version now that I really want to come out like in, like with the illest samples, the illest arrangement, because there's no, you know, I mean, we, in, in some of those sessions, G-Rap sessions and Eric B and Rakim, like, me and Rakim would sit there and Rakim's brother, Stevie Blast, he's a musical guy. Like, I mean, like trained musically with keyboards and everything. So sometimes I would put records in the mix and, you know, we would debate like, he'd be like, nah, that don't go with it, man. And I'm like, nah, man, that's, yo, that kind of thing. And now with Main Source, it was just like, you know, sky's the limit, like any idea that I wanted to throw in there, like there were, there were no debates or any feeling of like hesitation where it's like, oh, they might not like this or whatever. And, and then that practice came into play too, you know, just kind of, you know, with those guys, it was like, all right, cool. And then main source breaking out, it was like, we knew what we were doing. Hmm. Right. Okay. And I also liked, uh, on just hanging out, taking it back to think, uh, with Neat the Exotic shout out, and then with just yeah. hanging out, you shout out Nas. So yeah. one thing I did as a kid was when artists would uh, mention other artists in their raps, I'd write them down so I knew who to look for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I had to wait a while for Neat the Exotic, at least for me. But right. uh, yeah. But then I was like, wait, just hanging out. That's the same dude from Live at the Barbecue. That's crazy. So yeah, 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 yeah. So now nah, it was it wasn't a pop up thing, man. Like we was we was hanging out for real and just getting those getting that working early. And and I knew that those guys would you know they would make their entrance in the game some some way somehow, definitely. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.